Hello, everybody. I am Jake, a.k.a. Bomber, and I welcome you into Jobber Radio's monthly deathmatch rundown. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you several different things that took place in October 2023 inside the deathmatch world of professional wrestling. I'm talking anything from those five must-see deathmatches that you better not skip over to special happenings in the scene that took place. We got three more deathmatch tournaments that we got to recap this month, including one that hit a major milestone. And when it comes to those deathmatch championships, I have you covered in recapping each and every title match from the month. Now let's get this bad boy started with the Jesus Christ spot of the month. GCW hosted a pretty incredible War Games match on October 7th on the first night of their Fight Club event. While the match was filled with memorable spots, one incident stood out among the rest as a true Jesus Christ moment. Violento Jack and Ciclope fought their way up to the top of the scaffold that was beside the cage. And that is where Jack lifted Ciclope up and brought him crashing down with a gigantic sidewalk slam. It appeared Ciclope was out cold here and would require some medical attention right away. If you look closely, the doors and the glass do a terrible job at breaking his fall, and it looks like he crashed straight down onto the concrete floor. Now look, yes, it was very scary stuff here, but just three days later, he was in Japan wrestling, so luckily, Luckily, this did not result in any type of major injury here. If you ask me, it seems like Cyclope is showing up more and more in these crazy spots, but hey, you can mark them down for yet another Jesus Christ spot of the month. It is time to get into three deathmatch tournaments that happened this month. But before we get into those, I want to warn you that no, the editing. Okay, well, the editing may be bad in your eyes. I don't know. That may be true, but there may be stuff that looks like jump cuts that has nothing to do with the editing. That has everything to do with the way these matches were directed, with the way they were punched as the show was live. I was beyond frustrated at editing some of these this month. And it's a lot of like right when there's a big move about to happen, the director switches to a different camera and boom, boom, like every time on some of these shows. Um, it, very frustrating. It ruins the entire flow of everything that's going on. I don't know if it's trying to mimic a WWE style. I don't know exactly what it is. But I'm noticing it more and more while I'm editing these. So I don't know who's directing what shows. Now, I me mean, personally, I know if you're saying, oh, well, who, who are you to say what? I've been a director for 15 years myself. So I'm not just some asshole. But that's it. Uh, I just want to preface that. So as we go into these, uh, it's not jump cuts. So let's go. Combat Zone Wrestling hit a major milestone this month when it hosted its 20th Tournament of Death on October 7th. Kicking off the first round, last year's winner Bobby Beverly took on Eric Dillinger, who was making his CZW debut. And he got things started off hot with a suicide dive, followed immediately by a plancha to the outside, wiping the bev out. There were a ton of light tube shots here, most to the head, but also to the knees, chest, and back. And at times, it looked like last year's winner looked to be having a little too much fun out there. There was a good mix of ultra-violence, high-flying, brawling, and good old-fashioned technical wrestling. They would go on to trade suplexes on the chairs and light tubes, looking to advance to the next round. But only one man would be able to do that, and after this fisherman suplex through a pane of glass in the corner, that man would be Bobby Beverly. Dillinger didn't leave completely empty-handed, though. He got a nice little please come back chant from the fans. Next up, last year's TOD runner-up, Mickey Knuckles, took on a last-minute replacement here, Otis Kogar. This match saw the widest variety of weapons in the whole tournament, including a thumbtack water jug, a barbed wire crutch, barbed wire flamingos, light tubes, of course, boards, of course, kendo sticks, a thumbtack unicorn, just a straight razor, trash cans, thumbtack nerf darts, a thumbtack flesh... I don't even know if I can say this on YouTube. Thumbtack bats, barbed wire doors, chairs, and of course, Kenzins. And after all of that, Mickey locked in a submission to choke Otis out, sending her to the finals. Eric Ryan made his Tournament of Death debut, taking on Schlack, who has yet to score a TOD victory in his career. There were plenty of terracotta plants used in this match, much to Schlack's displeasure. And I'm sure Ryan didn't enjoy them too much either. While we saw shotgun kicks into panes of glass, we also got a solid amount of technical wrestling here. And then at one point, we almost got a solid minute of Schlack 
brutalizing Eric Ryan with light tubes. That was about the time Schlack started to dominate things, if you couldn't tell. Somehow this power bomb through a pane of glass wasn't enough to put Eric Ryan away. It would take one final diving clothesline to get that job done. So Schlack picks up his first ever TOD win as he moves on to the next round. In the final first round match, we got yet another CZW debut in Judge Joe Dredd, who had to take on his rival at this point in the deathmatch scene, Big F and Joe. This match ended up being the longest of the entire tournament, going over that 20 minute mark. And you'll see why, because these two brawled all over the ringside area, hitting each other with everything they could get their hands on. They even found their way over to this bus where Dredd was catapulted into it. Back near the ringside area, these two delivered, with Joe hitting a cannonball onto Dredd through a light tube board, and he drove a wall of forks into his back and then used two coat hangers to rearrange his face. And I'll take those coat hangers any day over a couple of sickles. Eventually, Dredd would get some offense in here with some light tube shots and a running cannonball of his own in a belly-to-back suplex onto a guardrail. As this match went on, doors were not very nice to dread, that's for sure. And hey, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this lemon golden shower was not as pleasant as it smelled. Now, I wonder if raw chickens to open wounds is a bad thing. I don't know. It probably is. The ending to this match saw Judge Joe Dredd beaten to a bloody pulp. In fact, the beatdown was so bad that the ref jumped in calling for the bell. That means Big F and Joe takes the win via referee stoppage. We would have some history made here at TOD 20 because for the first time in TOD history, the tournament would only be two rounds long because next up would be a four-way finals. We're talking Bobby Beverly, Mickey Knuckles, Schlack, and Big F and Joe, they would all get their shot at this year's trophy. The boards would be exposed in the ring and the ropes would be replaced with exploding barbed wire. More on that in a minute, by the way. Just a quick summary of this match, pure chaos. Bodies were flying everywhere and through everything. Oh my God, poor Mickey. She just kept eating light tubes left and right and Schlack seemed hell bent on ripping her arm off. Honestly, by the end of this thing, I think she took more damage than anybody else involved here. I feel like I have to point out how many wild light tube shots were just thrown around in this match. Usually you can count on one, maybe two, but dear Lord, these four were out here trying to murder each other. I mean, I know it's kind of the point. I get it. And I just love how during all this ultra violence, Mickey turned a hot dog around on Joe, shoving it down his throat. After Schlack and Beverly nearly killed each other with all of these light tube shots, it was time for the explosions. Sadly, the first explosion wasn't really caught on camera when Schlack and the Bev slammed into the barbed wire ropes. Then Mickey and Joe traded exploding baseball bat shots, nearly burning them alive. That wouldn't be the end though, because Joe would sling Mickey into the other exploding barbed wire ropes. With Beverly and Schlack pretty much taken out of the match, Joe hit one last DVD to pick up the win. Looking at the slow-mo replay, it does appear that Mickey got her shoulder up just in time, but the ref's ruling is final. Big effin' Joe wins Tournament of Death 20, making this his first deathmatch tournament win inside the United States. IWA Deep South were back for their 13th installment of the Carnage Cup, and that took place on October 21st. Round one would consist of four triple threat matches with only one person being eliminated. First up would be Little Sicko versus Brian White versus the Carnage Cup 10 winner, John Rare. Just getting the tournament started off, Little Sicko was nearly impaled on these gigantic skewers, and yeah, Brian took a fistful to the head as well. John Rare would light up some firecrackers on this light tube razor wire contraption, but he mistimed his jump, nearly getting himself killed in the process. There was this really weird moment where John Rare was walking around the outside of the ring, and he just started stabbing something into his own arm, and he opened himself up very badly. As if he hasn't suffered enough, there was another massive pile of firecrackers that were set off in the ring and it looks like Rare was completely consumed by him. Brian White would get that pinfall, meaning that himself and Little Sicko would be moving on to the second round. Obey came out next to take on the hardcore Hillbilly. Now, Hillbilly was caught up in these barbed wire ropes where Obey would light this massive line of firecrackers. We watched as Hardcore Hillbilly practically was burned alive here. Look at his skin. No clue how, but he continued the match. After a good while here, Blaine Evans entered the match late, getting this big advantage. The pun intended carnage continued with a Russian leg sweep into more razor wire. 
Blaine and Obey would hit a double suplex, sending Hillbilly into a kiddie pool of hell. They both would pin him, meaning they each move on to the second round. So next up, we would have the Carnage Cup 12 winner, Chewy Martinez, as he would go up against Sick Boy and Jay Blade. Blade ended up getting tossed all around in this match. Chewy was just having a good time in this one for sure. And Jay Blade was one that was not having a good time because he ended up getting dvd through a light tube log cabin. And if that wasn't enough to put him away, he was double teamed here by Chewy and Sick Boy, taking a doomsday device through another set of log cabins. And yep, that would be the end for Jay Blade. He would be eliminated here. In the final triple threat match in the first round, the Necro Butcher was taking part in his first Carnage Cup since the second one back in 2006, where he won the whole thing. He would be going up against Bryant Woods and Jimmy Controversy, who also joined this match late. Necro didn't seem to like Jimmy too much, I'm gonna be honest. And I guess neither did Bryant Woods for that matter. It seemed like every time Jimmy tried to get involved in the match, Necro or Woods would just swat him away. As this fight spilled out around the fans, Bryant really tore into his opponents. Jimmy Controversy tested the patience of Bryant Woods long enough until he was yeeted through a couple dozen light tubes to finally get himself eliminated. Necro and Bryant will move forward. Round two started with Little Sicko facing Obey. And the match itself was started with some submission attempts, but the panes of glass would soon be shattered. Little Sicko would fly high with his nice moonsault, and after beating the hell out of one another, Sicko would finish Obey off with a beautiful Spanish fly through a pane of glass and, yeah, razor wire. Little Sicko heads to the finals as the suicidal beast Bryant Woods would walk down to the ring next to take on Blaine Evans. Blaine realized the best way to take on a tank of a man like Bryant Woods would be to target his legs. After taking a ton of punishment, enough would be enough, and Woods would turn the tide with a big power slam through a light tube crucifix. A three count later, and Bryant Woods finds himself in the finals of the Carnage Cup for a third time. In the next match, Chewy Martinez went one-on-one -on -one with Brian White. And wow, this would be a complete one-sided beatdown where Chewy basically used one hand for most of this match. I'm not kidding. I mean, look at this. I don't quite know what this was. Maybe hot oil or hot wax? I'm not sure. They said it was like rubbing alcohol and lemon juice and commentary. I don't know about that. But either way, it left Brian screaming for his life. Whatever it was, it put an end to the match. Chewy would pin him in just over five minutes, sending Brian White running off for some help. In the final second round match, Nick Necro Butcher went to war with Sick Boy. From the start, these light tubes would cut Butcher's back open pretty bad. And then Necro would once again take his opponent for a little stroll around the fans, brawling all over the place. It seemed like anytime Necro was about to leave his feet, he would be able to reverse it and punish Sick Boy for even trying. Eventually, he would be able to latch onto Sick Boy with his Asianic spike to force Sick Boy to tap out. The finals were set, and with the sun coming down, car headlights were used as well as flashlights so we could see what was going on in the ring. The finals consisted of the Necro. Necro Butcher, Little Sicko, Bryant Woods, and Chewy Martinez. And this would be elimination rules here, people. There was a lot of chaos going on here in the ring for the whole first part of this match. I mean, look at this. Light tubes and blood were just flying everywhere. Little Sicko took the fight to Necro on the outside of the ring, while Bryant Woods would toss Chewy off the ring apron through light tubes, carpet strips, and a barbed wire board. That would mark the first elimination of this match, meaning that Chewy would not be winning the Carnage Cup back-to-back. -back. Just about a minute later, Bryant Woods would make his second elimination by laying Necro out with a lariat. We are now down to just Little Sicko and Bryant Woods. You could see a little bit of a size advantage here. Yeah, Little Sicko would be in for a world of hurt while Woods began to just overpower him with ease. After the slam, Woods even pinned Sicko, but then called for the match to start over for some reason. When the match continued, he nearly killed Little Sicko in that ring. They would then climb to the top of this U-Haul truck where Bryant Woods would lift Sicko up and bring him crashing down through a huge light tube, glass, barbed wire multi-layered contraption. Woods would crawl over and once again pin Little Sicko, this time putting an end to the 13th IWA Deep South Carnage Cup. After eliminating all three opponents here, Bryant Woods would finally bring home that Carnage Cup trophy. Hardcore Hustle organization held their third deathmatch tournament of the year, Tremont's fourth installment of his deathmatch tournament. There would be four first round matches, all fatal four ways, leading to one final fatal four way at the end. Getting things started off for the first match, we had Chris Bradley come out first to face off against Mouse, 
Neil Diamond Cutter, and Jimmy Chondo Lion. After trading carpet strip shots, Bradley used his size to his advantage here, looking like a monster out there. Chondo tried his best to put Mouse through a ladder, but not long after that, Neil would wrap himself around Chondo's leg and start driving staples into his bare feet. And look at Mouse, he just started gnawing away on that foot. And just in case you were wondering, yes, you got to see close-up footage of Jimmy pulling the staples out of his foot. Neil and Mouse took some bites out of one another before they both went flying through a door filled with debris. Bradley continued to showcase his strength, looking like the favorite to win here, until Mouse would fight back, laid him out with one of these nasty combos here. Chondo swooped in to slam Mouse, but it would be Neil Diamond Cutter who would hit his trademark rolling DVD to secure the victory. For match number two, Sean Campbell was making his H2O debut, taking on a returning Tim Donst in a red hot Malcolm Monroe the third and also an H2O veteran Lucky 13. There were lots of speed and high risk maneuvers broke out early in this one. Lucky 13 would continue to fly but against his own will into a door with Donst on the wrong end of things. Campbell hit a nice cactus elbow onto MM3 on the outside but Malcolm later returned the favor with a brain buster through a steel chair. Donst took this rough looking powerbomb onto a chair but that would be nothing compared to what Campbell would go through. Lucky 13 hit a Canadian destroyer onto MM3 down down onto Sean Campbell in light tubes. This just absolutely crushed Sean. Lucky 13 nabbed the three count victory to advance to the finals. Ron Bass Jr. was up next to go up against a debuting Hardway Heater, also H2O Hall of Famer Mickey Knuckles, and the current Danny Havoc hardcore champion, Bam Sullivan. Bam and Heater were foiled at the start, leading to stiff shots from Mickey and Ron. In fact, this was definitely the brawling match of round one, seeing a ton of strikes from all of the competitors. Mickey would be first to taste glass by being launched face first into two bundles of light tubes. Meanwhile, Bam would be the first to taste wood with this fallaway slam. Bam tried to take the win with this spear, but Mickey came in with an unconventional yet effective pin breakup. Then Ron was about to hit this superplex onto Mickey three barbed wire door, but Heater and Bam hit it with the double power bomb instead. Bam countered a light tube strike beautifully from Heater, but Mickey came from behind to lay Bam out with her trademark pump handle slam onto Ron, who was stuck under this door. So she would pin Ron Bass Jr. to take the win, moving her to join Neil Diamond Cutter and Lucky 13 in the finals. In the last match of the opening round, Christian Ross was up next, who actually won the second Tremont Deathmatch tournament with partner Chris Bradley. He would be going up against Danny DeMonto, the long-sleeved, lovable psychopath Tommy Vendetta, and H2O's Hardcore Kingdom 5 winner, Declan Grant. So Danny tried talking everybody into doing this traditional tag team deathmatch here. I'm talking holding the tag team rope and everything, but you can probably guess that it didn't quite work out good for him. Business would eventually pick up with a huge barrage of light tube headshots. Ross would plant Declan down with the end of days, but took several chair shots from behind right afterwards. Now rocked, Ross would miss a dive into a door and would get driven down to the mat with Tommy's pile driver. At one point, Declan suffered a bad cut and had to get it taped up. Back in the ring, DeMonto tried to put Tommy away with his diving elbow through a door and light tubes, but as he pinned Tommy, Atticus Kogar's music played, distracting Danny. As he looked over towards the entranceway, Declan rolled Danny up, surprising him with the win. So that means our TDMT4 finals are set. Bad cut and all, Declan Grant came down to the ring first to take on Mickey Knuckles, Lucky 13, and Neil Diamond Cutter. Mickey and Neil thought they outsmarted Lucky and Declan, but they got the last laugh. A lot would transpire here during this nearly 20 minute final match. Neil would hit this perfect spear on Lucky through a door. Mickey got a light tube to the behind. As she took another shot to the head, Neil got slammed right through this door. His forehead then welcomed a gusset plate. Lucky 13 wiped out a couple rows of chairs. Declan got in a spear of his own onto Mickey, sending her straight through a pane of glass. Neil would then introduce skewers into the match, first driving them into the head of Declan and then over to Mickey's. Neil took a rough looking slam onto a chair and tubes, but somehow kicked out it too. Then we would get this great set of rapid fire moves and combos from everyone involved nothing was enough to take the win though that's when jimmy lyon decided to butt his nose into the match by coming out and attacking neil from behind and then dragging him backstage with neil basically eliminated from this match and with everybody barely able to stand they had one last light tube rally in the middle of the ring lucky took declan out with a mushroom stomp but it would be mickey who would hit two of her pump handle slams the second one being on to declan grant who she pinned to win the match and the entire tournament. This marks Mickey Knuckles' second deathmatch tournament win in back-to-back -back months. That is an amazing accomplishment for your H2O Hall of Famer and your Tremont's Deathmatch Tournament 4 winner.
We're going to do something a little different here on the rundown. While watching the Carnage Cup, I could not help but notice how insanely funny and entertaining Larry Legend was. Hey, I've been a CCW fan for a very long time. I've been a Larry Legend fan for a long time, so it's not that. But for some reason, that show in particular, being out there in the woods in Tennessee and Larry just being on another level, having to fill time, there was a lot of funniness. So I got a little montage we're about to roll. Like I said, a little different than what we've done here in the rundown before, but I think you should see it. This may be just for me. I don't know, but I found it funny as hell. So here we go. Larry Legend, Carnage Cup 13. Java Radio highlights. Let's go. What in the goddamn hell is a Saw Forever death match? What the? Oh my gosh! What the fuck is this? What, what is this? You can call me Hillbilly Legend. Oh boy. Today. Okay. We made it. Oh, I don't really feel like doing this. He doesn't feel like doing this. Yeah, I don't feel like doing this, and no one wants to talk to me. What do you want me to do? Like just stand here, like make shit up? Why is this not like? Why can't I hear myself? Take a look at the ring over here. Take a look at this fuckery right here. Constructed with brown and black tape. That's dead. The tape below. Log tube light cabins. Or wait, what am I trying to say? You know what I'm trying to say. My first carnage cup. Larry, get over it. We're on, pal. We're on. Where are you going now? What's going on, man? Put the headphones on. Well, I mean, I got to oh, do my ears. <laughs> I mean, I got to do this, and then I got to do that. What do we got right here? Well, must be going through Jay Blade's mind. I mean, he's in there with two Latin Americans. How do you know Spanish? I used to live in the Bronx. This next match is going to be a Deep South Funhouse match. Now, I don't know what that means. Is that rubbing alcohol over there? Please don't tell me that we're using rubbing alcohol in this match. I want to smell it. The goddamn salt. Oh my god. Look at this goddamn motherfucking contraption here. Just a bunch of fucking knives. Whatever this thing is, a knife. How's the ring looking? Are we almost done over there? We're gonna put a mother that thing. Orange coat. Do you know what someone could do with this shit? Oh god. Do you know the type of shit that someone could do with this in the middle of a wrestling ring? We got motherfucking lemons Very out legend, here. Where are the lemons? Shy. The goddamn lemons are already cut. Syringes right over here, they could be filled with anything. Oh, Hep look at C, that. Hep B, AIDS. Lord have mercy, we got a wasp. This is not an octagon. What do we call something with six sides? I probably would have just bought a gun. Maybe one day, I'll be able to be an IWA. And that day has come today. There's no Ian Rotten around, thank God. He's ripping them apart, and I like it. For one-on-one -on -one action here in the semifinals. Larry, um, you're, you're, you're an interesting person. Why are you winking at me? Uh, we're colleagues. All right. We're partners. Oh. That's it. That was it. Oh, Necro put the brakes on there. He was like, fuck it. When I see those torches come out, I'm out of here, okay? You're doing this broadcast by yourself, and I'll see you tomorrow, okay? The second that I see them goddamn torches, I'm out of here. My black ass is gone. Oh, look at this woman. Get that woman out of the way. Right in the dick. I like to call it a dick. I don't even know how I'm going to get in here. It's going to be hard for us to be able to make out what the hell is going oh. on. I don't think there's any way that these three men would let that little twig come out on top. Why are you biting your nails? With that, I'm scared. Oh. I'm scared, goddammit. This is a blood ritual. This is a sacrifice that we're watching. What the fuck is this, Chris? The stars and bars never look so beautiful. I will never forget the Carnage Cup 13. Oh. So before we get into the title matches that happened in October, I want to bring up a couple things. Yes, we're not doing a full news article section here on the rundown but there's a couple things noteworthy that has been going on just super quick bullet points uh one of them is maybe drake younger is back in wrestling maybe he's unretiring i don't know he said he was medically cleared at the circle six show he took on dale patrick's there ended up winning the match i don't know if that's going to lead to more stuff at circle six maybe he's going to come back to xpw either way i don't know maybe drake younger is going to be back we never thought he was at all, but maybe he will be back. Speaking of Dale Patrick's, he's run into a little rough spot in his personal life. 
He's reached out. He's asking for fans to help him out if you can. Jobber Radio will be sponsoring Dale Patrick's for their AWR show, No Ring, No Fucks Given, on November 17th, I believe it is. Just checked, it is November 17th, so there you go. Go support Dale Patrick's. I know Hoodfoot ran into some issues before as well, recently, I think, like a month or two ago. So go support these guys. This is the Deathmatch Wrestling scene. We're supposed to be a community here. Let's help each other out when we need some help. So go do that. Please. The last little bullet point here is there's going to be a title match that is not going to be shown here on the run now for this month. Not because I didn't want to is because wrestle rave has not put out their show yet in time for it to happen. So I have a announcement video that is going to be coming out in the next month or two. It's probably going to come out in December um, announcing big things. That's going to be happening for Java radio stuff. I got planned. It's gonna be like a yearly, like what's going to happen next year type of video. Uh, I'm going to address that. So, for example, you're not going to see that match now, but little spoiler, the match will show up here on the channel. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. Just a little teaser. But yes, the Wrestle Rave Deathmatch title match is not going to be appearing on this show, but it will be shown on the channel here in the future. So, hey, whenever it shows up on IWTV, just go watch it. So maybe that will help out, too. All right, enough of the quick little bullet points. Let's get into There was quite a few title matches for this month. I've talked too long. Let's get into them. GCW made their way back to Japan as the ultra-violent champion Rita Yamashita, now deep into her 400-plus day reign as champion, put her belt on the line against Taka Yuki Yuki at GCW's To Live and Die in Tokyo event on October 10th. Now, this would be a wild match, which nearly hit that 20 minute mark, seeing all kinds of craziness. To start things off, both competitors went flying headfirst through a barbed wire board, with Rita probably getting the worst of it, to be honest. With the fight staying out amongst the fans, Ayuki grabbed a fan's umbrella and body slammed Rita onto it. If you ask me, it's kind of rude, but I do love it. So the challenger brought this cheese grater into play, and you know, nothing crazy there, right? Well, how about a cheese grater on a power drill? He was about to use it down low on Rena, but even she surprised herself with this counter. As Rena started to fight back, as she always does, she hit a body slam onto the challenger, onto this chair and barbed wire board. Gusset plates then came into play, first into Takayuki, and then Rena just drove them into her own head, firing herself up. That's around the time Takayuki started to strip down and gave Rena a low blow. But stripping down would cost him big because he would be driven down bare feet first onto barbed wire. In a weird twist, he would shoot the champ up onto his shoulders and spin around on their barbed wire, all being barefoot. What am I watching right now? Rita would try to counter with a pin, but no luck there. If things weren't crazy enough, Rita would then pull her shoes off as well, driving her opponent into the barbed wire. With that barbed wire still hanging off of both of them, she would hit that splash mountain bomb to secure the win. Like I said, a wild match, a fun match too, with Rina leaving still the champion. Two nights later, still in Japan, Rina Yamashita would place her GCW Ultraviolet Championship on the line, but this time inside the infamous Corkin Hall at GCW's The World on GCW event against Masha Slamovich. That is right, folks. We got a rematch from their awesome battle back at Cage of Survival 2, and this match here certainly did not disappoint. Just like Rena's first title defense of the month, this would also hit that nearly 20-minute mark. A light tube to the head sent Rita into her Matrix-style move, but as she came out of it, she took another brutal shot. The champ would be in for a rough night because she would also take an air raid crash onto the outside through a bunch of tubes. Now back in the ring, Rena brought Masha down onto some tubes with a big suplex from the top rope. Going back and forth with a crown of barbed wire, Masha tore into Rena and kicked her head off right here with some light tubes to the head. The champion would be able to kick out of this scary looking hangman's power bomb. And you know what? Just like their first encounter, the strikes in this match were absolutely vicious. They traded some light tube shots until they had to reload with a big light tube bundle where they collided with one another. The crowd was really loving this match. And then this pal driver right here is the closest Rena has came to losing her title. But after countering this kick to the head, Rena took full control. She drilled Masha with tubes to the head and then would land not one, but two Splash Mountain Bombs to get the victory. That means the reign continues as Rena Yamashita finishes October still your GCW Ultra Violent Champion. And at this point, I don't know if she's ever going to lose the title. On Friday the 13th, ICW No Holds Barred held their Volume 53 show, which was main evented by the American Deathmatch Champion Hoodfoot, 
taking on the one and only Mickey Knuckles. When Mickey's involved, you know you're always in for a good time, and this was a fun mix of ultra-violence and a little bit of adult comedy. All the way through, though, the fans were treated to some suplexes on the outside, plenty of light tube shots, gusset plates, several ball bag grabs, fan interaction, brawling all over the arena, full-on concussion-inducing headbutts, barbed wire doors, and plenty more. Mickey would eat a couple clotheslines, but she showed no signs of slowing down, even after one to the back of the head. The only way the champ would be able to put Mickey away would be to hit this inverted pump handle slam. Ironically, the pump handle slam is Mickey's finisher too. But pay close attention to this kick out. It was very close, but referee Shiny Shoes signaled for the bell, match over. Hoodfoot's impressive reign continues on after a hard fought in a very close battle with Mickey Knuckles. No surprise here, the very next night, Hoodfoot found himself in the main event yet again, defending his ICW American Deathmatch World Championship at ICW No Holds Bars Volume 54 show. This time, his worthy opponent would be Pagano. Things started with some headlocks, but escalated quickly once the match poured outside of the ring. And look at this, Pagano just grabs his fan's beer can bites into it, whipping the can apart, and carves it into Hoodfoot's forehead. Now that is some gnarly stuff. The champ had plenty of violence to dish out as well though, as he hit some light tube headbutts and this DDT through a door. After a headbutt through a chair, the challenger caught Hoodfoot with a nice code breaker. He would also hit this like kind of jumping pile driver onto what looked like a tumbleweed of barbed wire. Pagano would push his luck one too many times after crashing and burning with this high risk move, leading to Hoodfoot's trademark, Saito Suplex, but it wouldn't be enough. He then connected with that pump handle slam maneuver, which apparently is gonna be called the South Side Flosion to seal the victory. So yeah, it looks like Hoodfoot has brought out a new trademark maneuver, but the result remains the same. Multiple successful title offenses in one month here. Just an insane year for this man. This marks Hoodfoot's 12th title defense now as he has eclipsed over 200 days as champion. The historic RPW Rust Belt Championship reign of Randy West was on the line as she was putting the belt up against the winner of RPW's King of the Kill Tournament, that is Tommy Vendetta. And this match, of course, took place at RPW's Devil's Night 2 on October 14th. The long-sleeved era of Tommy Vendetta was in full effect here as he pissed off the fans with an attack from behind, jump-starting this match. After getting dominated for a little bit here, Randy grabbed this chain looking to get back into the match and she whipped it around the leg of Vendetta. That allowed her to get on top of him for a little bit of a beatdown. She also used it to start dragging him around the ring to do as she pleased. Much to the fans' pleasure, Randy managed to rip Tommy's shirt off, but of course he was wearing a second one underneath. Sadly for Tommy though, that shirt does not protect him against the concrete floor. Randy would stack up some doors on the outside of the ring and after drilling Tommy with prickly Pete, the challenger fell back, almost breaking his back in half. Those doors did not give one bit. She rolled Tommy back into the ring, hitting her shadows over hell splash, looking to put it into this match. But as she was rolling Vendetta over, he swiftly rolled her up into a small package, picking up a shocking victory. As the booze filled Berwyn Eagles, Thomas Oliver Vendetta just began laughing as he clutched his new title tight. Randy's epic title reign comes to a close at 595 days, a number that most likely will never be touched. In another deathmatch title that was defended at RPW's Devil's Night 2, Schwartzy faced a tall task, putting his RPW Kamikaze title up against Remington Roar. The champ did his best to evade the powerhouse challenger, but eventually his luck would run out. Roar would begin choking the life out of Schwartzy with a chain, and things started to look a little grim. Getting desperate, the champ grabbed one of Roar's machetes, but even that backfired, leaving him on the wrong end of the blade. Don't get me wrong, Schwartzy did get a little bit of offense in here, but even his Hiawaska DDT failed to go his way. Things did start to look up for Schwartzy when he caught Roar off guard with a pane of glass to the face, but the writing was on the wall. This would be Remington Roar's night. He finished Schwartzy off in spectacular fashion, by the way, to score a three count victory and win the RPW Kamikaze Championship. Schwartzy's reign comes to an end at 119 days with three successful title defenses, but the reign of Roar has begun.
On October 28th at H2O Bound by Blood, the Danny Havoc Hardcore World Championship kicked off with Bam Sullivan Stormy the Ring attacking the challenger, President Hawkins. This match saw a ton of interference and resembled more of a tag team match at points with Brax and JB Anderson at ringside. We did see some cookie sheets, a gusset plate, and some chairs, but other than that, this match mainly focused on the story of the President's shady cabinet trying to screw Bam over. It seemed like no matter what they tried to do to Bam, he refused to stay down. Now, the end of this match did seem a little wonky here as JB punched Hawkins, seeing him gracefully fall down into a door. At that exact same time, Brax brought Bam crashing down on top of him with an electric chair drop. Bam laid on top of the president to pick up the win, meaning that Bam holds on to the title through the month of October. XPW's Halloween in Hell 4 took place on October 29th, and in that main event, Schlack defended both his XPW World title as well as his King of the Death Matches title against a returning homeless Jimmy. In fact, the last time that Jimmy stepped foot in XPW was all the way back in 2009, and here he comes walking in to face one of the most dangerous deathmatch wrestlers on the entire planet. Jimmy tried his best to keep up with the human meat grinder, but Schlack brutalized him from the get-go. Getting pretty desperate here, the challenger tried to pull off a high-risk maneuver and nearly knocked himself out cold on the floor, falling head first. And no, Schlack would not let up either by immediately double stomping glass down onto the back of his head. Stop! He's already dead. Even just a simple boot rake turned into the stomp here, leading to Jimmy snapping, going all in on the champ. Maybe it was from the blood loss, maybe it was from the exhaustion, or maybe it was from some concussions, but whatever the plan was here for Homeless Jimmy, it didn't quite pan out. Suddenly, Eric Ryan came down to the ring with a bundle of light tubes to take Schlack out, but he missed drilling Homeless Jimmy in the face, leading to his pinfall. Eric Ryan didn't seem to care either way, but Schlack leaves Halloween in Hell 4, still your XPW King of the Death Matches champion. It is now time for the five must-see death matches that you need to go watch from October. Super quick shout out to Spooky Dust Podcast. They put out a show on IWTV. Go check it out right now. It's called the Famous Monsters of Deathmatch. They had six death matches, all cinematic death matches for the month of October here. Kind of spooky stuff. They got an asylum at a whole lot of different type of matches. You need to go check them out. Driver Radio will always try to promote other content creators as well as, of course, the death match companies. There's wrestlers from True Wrestling Underground, P.O.R., Death Match Down Under. There was a lot that went down. Go check it out. It's something like we've never seen before, at least in the death match realm, for a full show, all cinematic death matches, a spooky season. That's what it's about. It's spooky season, people. So having said that, we are getting into the five death matches that you need to watch from October. Let's go. Now, I feel like this one could be cheating, but the death of over on IWTV was too fun to pass up for this month. Unlike the other matches that I give a full recap of, I'm not going to spoil this because this is a cinematic death match that plays out like a movie and nobody likes it when you spoil a movie. But I'll go over the plot, which is pretty simple. The director of IWTV's championship committee, Avery Good, has tasked Matt Tremont with putting an end to the thorn in his side, Cruel. That's going to be the match, Cruel versus Matt Tremont. But for me, it's the build up to the match that helps make this video. The IWTV crew head over to Brandon and Casey Kirk's home to interview them about deathmatch wrestling. Just at the mention of Cruel's name, you can see the tension in the interview shift. And for those of you that don't know, let's just say they've had a very complicated feud with Cruel over the past year plus. So after a little tension there, the IWTV crew are headed out to find Crimson Creek to film the match between Tremont and Cruel and it plays out more like an old slasher horror flick. Amazingly enough, several people are murdered on the way to this match as we get rituals and bonfires and spooky scenery. It's great. Now, the match itself is a fun experience, but I'm going to have to stop this right here. I know this is why it's kind of cheating, but you need to go over to IWTV and watch The Death Of If You Haven't Already. It's perfect for the Halloween season. Trust me. At ICW No Holds Barred Volume 54 event on October 14th, we got a mad doctor with Dr. Redacted versus a monster in Cruel. Before the bell even rang, Redacted ran over, shoving a needle into Cruel's arm, injecting him with something. I mean, that didn't save him from being yeeted into two different doors, though. Redacted looked like an escape patient from one of the Halloween movies as he tried to use his body as a weapon against Cruel. He would need a choke slam through a door on the outside of the ring, but the bottom door did not break. Don't worry, though, Cruel would easily 
fix that with a ferocious power bomb. The injection at the beginning of the match started to affect Cruel, disorienting him from time to time. And just as planned, that allowed brief moments for Redacted to take advantage, which was really a fun story to follow throughout this match. Cruel would kind of rage out and fight whatever was flowing through his body, but if that wasn't enough, Doc would spit green mist into Cruel's face. He would drive a couple gusset plates into Cruel's chest, and then looking for a free win, he climbed to the top of the platform with his trash can. Cruel would easily sidestep that and then cave the trash can in, as well as redact its head. And then it was scorched earth time. Yep, that would be it for this one. This was a little scary, but a very fun match. Easily, I think, a must-see for this month. In the main event on the second night of GCW's Fight Club, we had a match with two all-time deathmatch greats. Matt Tremont took on the legend from Japan, Jun Kasai. Now, obviously, this was a good match, but just off of the historical purposes alone, I think this is a must-see. There would be some big slams, some powerful light tube shots, barbed wire tear and human flesh, insane crashes to the outside. I'm talking more than just one, by the way. And you know with Kasai, there's going to be some high flying going on. I'm not saying we're never going to see two legends go at it like this again, but this was a rare treat for deathmatch wrestling fans. Neither man would want to stay down here, especially Tremont, who was out there pulling out all the stops. It would take a splash from the top rope, more tubes to the face, an S. T.O. skewers to the head, a fall from a ladder, and one final splash to eventually take the bulldozer out. I've probably used the term legends one too many times already, but there's no better way to describe these two, I'm telling you. Don't pass up on seeing this historical match. Heading out to Atlantic City, GCW held two Fight Club shows this year. On the second night, we were treated with a memorable one-on-one -on -one contest between the Southern Psycho Mance Warner and the crazy kid Masashi Takeda. Blood was spilled very early in this with some broken light tubes to the head and mouth, as well as Takeda's trademark giant scissors. Eat your heart out, acclaimed. The match continuously ramped up the ultra violence with spears into light tubes. There was a huge sky high suplex down through glass, chairs, and a door. Mance also took this rough looking German suplex through more glass and light tubes. Of course, we saw some more light tubes brought into play as well as some dual scissor stabbing. All the way throughout this match, these two had the crowd on the edge of their seat and rightfully so. The big finish came when Takeda drenched a door with lighter fluid and lit it ablaze. He proceeded to plant Mancer down with his lifting inverted DDT through the flaming door to score the three count victory. As I always say on these things, these quick recaps never do the match true justice. If you miss this, go check it out. It may have been one of the best of the year. The climax to the whole GCW Freedoms feud took place in the main event on night one of GCW's Fight Club event on October 7th. This match is a whopping 43 minutes long, so I'm going to do my best to bring you the major highlights as fast as I can. Let's get into it. We are talking elimination war games rules here, people. Team GCW was comprised of Ciclope, Muedo Extremo, John Wayne Murdoch, Rina Yamashita, and of course, Nick F. Engage. Bear with me on these names here, but Team Freedoms had Masashi Takeda, Takashi Sasaki, Toto Sakuda, Vilinto Jack, and Jun Kasai representing them. Scissors, chairs, light tubes were all used early on here as Freedoms took advantage of the numbers game. But as more and more competitors enter the cage, the violence ramped up, making it kind of hard for the production team to follow everything going on. We had Vilinto Jack showcasing his strength as Los Macisos were able to utilize their tag team synergy. This all built up to the two final members of each team, Jun Kasai and Nick Gage, as they entered this match with insane responses. Once everybody finally entered this match, the eliminations could begin. Murdoch would be the first to be eliminated here with this package pile driver from Jack. Sasaki would be taken out by Los Macisos after this big moonsault from Ciclope. Just keep in mind, I'm skipping over a lot of good stuff here. This is just a quick recap, and that is why you need to go watch this match in full for yourself. Vilento, Jack, and Ciclope found their way to the top of the cage where both were eliminated after one of the biggest sidewalk slams you were ever going to see. Muedo Extremo would be eliminated next after being dropped on his head by Takeda's lifting inverted DDT through a pane of glass. Before we got to that next elimination, and Rina and Takeda would shower each other in glass. So Rina and Seguda would climb up to the top of the cage where Rina would shove him over off one side of the scaffold. As he hung on for dear life, Rina would finish him off with a light tube, sending Todu crashing down through multiple doors to the floor 
being eliminated. Jun Kasai wasted no time climbing up to Rina to lay a big smooch on her and then chuck her down off into the ring. That's where he leapt off the scaffold, crushing her with his trademark splash. With Rina being eliminated, that left Nick Gage in a two-on-one battle here. Ah, I mean, that's nothing a little pizza cutter can't fix. It definitely wasn't easy by any means, but Gage was able to hit a senton onto some chairs and tubes to finally eliminate Takeda. We were down to just Nick Gage and Jun Kasai now. Kasai landed his splash but Gage jolted up at the count of one. Then Gage would hit his choke breaker into a pile driver combo only for Kasai now to kick out at one. The end would come though after Gage's pile driver threw a pane of glass. Ladies and gentlemen, Team GCW gets that win. Look everybody, from start to finish, this was a wild ride that I believe will be a GCW classic for years to come. Spooky season has come and gone, and dear Lord, was this episode a monster to, pun intended, a huge monster to create. If you've watched the whole episode, you've heard me already say it several times. Please support the Deathmatch community, support Deathmatch Wrestling, support the wrestlers, support everything you can, support each other, quit being dicks to each other online. I see you out there. I see you out there doing it. And for the love of God, directors, quit punching your shows right when a move is about to have an impact, when you're about to see two people crash down through this crazy contraption don't switch the camera ruining the shot don't do that that's criticism that's not being a dick by the way i hope that qualifies but either way that is the end of the episode super long here i'm jake aka bomber i hope you enjoyed the jobber radio monthly deathmatch rundown please show up next month november go out there support deathmatch wrestling pay the ones who do what we all love we'll see you on the next video goodbye everybody 